G'day, everybody, and I am here with Laura Roder. She's a lifelong entrepreneur and founder of several multi-million dollar bootstrap companies. She's the founder of Paperbell, and she's spoken all over the world, not only travels over the world, but spoken at the White House, uh, the University of Southern California, Loyola Marion University, the list goes on. And I'm excited to talk to you about your impact on business coaches and mm. especially about the free tech hacks that we can all learn from. So, Laura, without further ado, uh, I'm going to say welcome to the show. And are you a morning girl or an evening girl? Oh, morning, definitely. I'm at my most productive in the morning. My brain's about done by about three o'clock and I've never been able to work in the, the evening or night or anything like that. That's just wind down time for me. Yeah, fantastic. Well, because you are in the UK right now, but originally from Austin, Texas, mm -hmm. and I'm in the morning, I feel super fresh in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and and we should therefore have a fun chat. I think I've just got you before the wind down period. So thank you, you, did. For, you did. for creating time. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, what kind of challenges are your clients who use your software? Okay. Are they experiencing? Yeah. So the challenges they're experiencing that lead them to search for paper bell. Basically the big one is I find that most coaches love to coach. They don't love to be a virtual assistant. They don't love to figure out tech. I mean, honestly, if they could really not run a business and just coach all day, that would kind of be their dream. So we find that people come to us when they're frustrated by tying a bunch of different tech tools together, or they find themselves just spending way too much time on administrative work. Uh, another thing that really trips people up is having to spend your time with clients talking about payments or talking about scheduling. You know, I've heard from so many coaches, oh, it's the worst when I'm talking to a client and I know they haven't paid their invoice. And then instead of spending our time coaching, I have to have this awkward conversation about have you paid it yet? Did it not come through? Okay, check this account, check that account. So yeah, people use Paperbell when they just want to have all that handled, basically. Taken care of. Well, I can certainly relate to that. If I could yeah. just coach <laughs> and do my podcasting interview all day, I would I would certainly love that. So within that, are you able to share uh, a compelling story about maybe one of your clients that encapsulates the profound mm -hmm. impact that, you know, and the value of your the software's that you've created? Yeah, I actually have, you know, it's actually a story that helped inspire me to build the software. So it was a coach that I had hired. So I was the client and I, I had hired her as my coach and we were meeting um, every week and she said, okay, I'm going to need to take, you know, the last week of, of March off. And I'm like, oh, you're, you know, you're going on holiday or you're going somewhere fun. And she goes, no, I'm just, I'm just doing all, all of my business catch up. And I was like, what do you mean? And she's like, I've gotten so far behind on all my business catch up that I have to take a week off from talking to clients just to do like she had a bunch of clients. She had an invoice. She had no idea who owed her money. You know, she hadn't done any of her bookkeeping or taxes or anything. And this is a bit of like an extreme story, maybe, but not that much. You know, I find a lot of coaches end up in this catch up period. And what kills me about it is, you know, I was paying her per session. So she was literally just losing money for that whole week. Like she had to clear her client calendar for a week because it had gotten so crazy. And when I saw that happening, I'm like, God, there's so many things that she's stopping to catch up on that software could just handle automatically. Like payments is a big one, you know, with Paperbell, your clients are just billed automatically. Your clients have always paid before they get on the phone with you. If there's a payment plan, it just gets pulled automatically. So you don't have to send invoices, check if the invoice is sent, check if someone, you know, oh, they sent it, they already sent it, but the payment hasn't landed yet. You just don't have to do all those things again, be so time mm. consuming. Mm, I love that story. And I love the fact that you had a coach yourself and invested in a coach for you. Uh, as well. Yeah. 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 Why did you do that? Um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm not just president of favor bell, but I also, I'm a, a coach and a, a coachee. So I'm, I'm more of a consultant. I've done some business coaching, consulting myself. I'm definitely, um, a believer in receiving coaching, business coaching, life coaching, mindset coaching, you know, to me, the idea of coaching is having another human 
help you get closer to a goal, right? Rather, that's some sort of athletic coach, executive coach, marriage coach, whatever it is. So it's always a bit funny to me when people are are skeptical of coaching. You know, sometimes people will be like, "Oh, coaching isn't isn't that a scam?" I'm like, I don't really see how someone else, like you're just talking to another person and they're helping you get what you want. It seems, it seems like a pretty good idea to me. So, and you know, I think the whole world is definitely catching up on mm. coaching it used to be something that was viewed more skeptically and then now the more people experience it for themselves or have friends who have tried coaches i mean sitting down with another person and focusing on the problems the things you want to change is just really powerful and effective in my experience mm, mm. so can you tell us a little bit more about your personal journey and what are some of the key milestones that have shaped you know where you are today yeah, so I've been an entrepreneur for a, a really long time, almost 20 years. I need to figure out the exact number of years, but in in that ballpark. So I've kind of, I started out um, when I was quite young, obviously. I think I was 20 or 21 um, when I first started working for myself full time. And I, I haven't looked back since. So I started out as a, a freelance web designer and moved from there to doing online courses. So basically I've kind of changed with all the kind of trends of the internet and online businesses. So going from freelancer to online courses to software, um, I had a very successful software business, Meet Edgar, a social media scheduling tool uh, that I exited. And after I was out of that, I actually started doing some business coaching. And that's kind of how I came to the idea for Paperbell is the experience that I was having as a coach like I said, the experience I saw other coaches having, I really wanted to create software so coaches could focus more on the coaching than the business. Mm. And I know that, you know, growing up in Austin, Texas, correct me if I'm wrong, mm-hmm. like, did you have this entrepreneurial spirit when you were a kid? Like, is it something that you think people can learn or was it something that's always been within you to to grow in numerous multi-million dollar businesses? Yeah, I mean, I think it's something that anyone can learn who wants to. I think uh, something that's been a huge privilege of mine is that my family was self-employed. So my dad is an architect, a residential architect, and my mom would help him do the bookkeeping and things like that. So his business was very small. He actually had a few employees for a while and then he had to let them all go and there was a recession and then he was much happier working as a a solo operator. Um, So it's not like he was some sort of business mogul, but that I knew that's how my family made money was from my parents' business. So I do think that that was such a blessing for me because I know a lot of people entrepreneurs or business owners is this very foreign thing to them you know their family's just like that's crazy that's risky to me it was a normal way to make an income as you provide a service and and people pay you for it and I knew that it had like ups and downs and some years my family made more money than others but you know we had a, a normal life and it provided everything we needed so I do think I was very lucky that it just helped me it wasn't such a big mental shift to think okay I want to work for myself and Anyone who wants to start a business, I really encourage them to start by being a freelancer, some sort of service business, because it's something you can easily do on the side. It's something you can do right away. You don't have to start this larger business. It just kind of, you can prove to yourself, okay, I have skills I can provide. People pay me for those skills. Now I have a business. Yeah. Somebody who I follow, uh, Rashid Tabakawala, he always talks about viewing yourself as a company of one. And he thinks mm-hmm. that's the way of the future. And I think you just summarized that beautifully around how even if you do have a regular hours job, if you do have mm-hmm. a side hustle while well, you're an entrepreneur, that's the start of your yeah. journey. I love that. I love that. Um, in one to a maximum of three words, what do you think makes a great coach? Oh, I love that question. I'm I'm thinking the word that's coming to mind is reflection. Because I think what a really great coach does is helps you to see yourself and understand yourself better. Um, I know for me, just talking through things out loud, I'm often able to hear myself saying things out loud where I'm like, wait, what, huh? What did I just, what did I just, what is that crazy thing that just came out of my mouth? And I think, 
you know, great coaching experiences that I've had, sometimes just their presence, not even saying anything, you realize the words coming out of your mouth. And then you realize, wait, that's not, you know, I don't really believe that, or I don't want to believe that, or this is not how I want to operate. So I think, I think great coaches have that beautiful power to just sometimes very quietly let yourself reflect back and and see and get to know yourself better. Mm, like the mirror, it's almost holding up a mirror as you, you, mm-hmm. you, you visually showed that, that beautifully. So when you do business consulting, business coaching specifically, what are the internal resources that you draw upon um, to put yourself in the role of being a great coach? What, mm-hmm. what things do you have to uh, yeah. So this, I haven't done any coaching for about three years, but I actually just took on a friend of mine as a client um, because he's like, I've always kind of secretly wanted you to actually formally coach me. And I'm like, oh, all I do is think about what I would want to change in your business. So I would, <laughs> I would love that. Um, so we just started working together and I'm finding that the biggest thing that I'm doing with him so far is just well, one, the first big thing we did together is just get clear on all of his numbers. So this was something that he hadn't looked at in a long time. There were some areas where he kind of didn't want to look at his numbers. And this is such a common theme for all sorts of business owners is there's things that we kind of don't want to know that we're kind of hiding from. We might tell ourselves, well, we have sort of an idea of you know how much profit I'm making or how many clients I have, but I've never actually sat down and counted (laughs) those things. So I think that's definitely the first resource that I go to is like, okay, first of all, let's just, you know, the classic point A to point B, you have to know where point A is like, let's get the lay of the land. Let's, let's dig out all your numbers and, and see what's, what's really going on in this business. What a great reminder for all us coaches out there. Yes. (laughs) To get clear on our numbers, that is very inspiring, especially this time of year, it is a bit of an emergency push in in the United mm. States anyway with the year the year end it's mm-hmm. like uh oh mm-hmm. <laughs> better get on top of that <laughs> but there are so many other ways to to do that to be more resourceful so thank you for sharing that in the ever evolving coaching landscape what disruptive idea do you have that could impact the way we coach in 2030 so i am a huge proponent of bring back one-on-one coaching. So <laughs> Ooh, tell me more. Yeah. yeah. So it's not like one-on-one coaching has ever gone away, but so much of what we talk about in the coaching industry is talking about group programs, talking about courses, talking about leverage, right? And I think it's gotten to the point where some coaches even feel embarrassed to be doing one-on-one coaching. They feel like, oh, that's not a leverage business. That's not, you know, quote unquote, real business. Scalable. And I think that's such, yeah, not scalable. And I think that's such a shame because the reason why most people get into coaching is that they love talking to other humans, right? They love that one-on-one getting to dive really deep, getting, you know, to have those amazing epiphanies, aha moments, transformations. And, and that, if you want to do a group program, if you want to do courses, I'm certainly not saying anything bad about that. But what I am saying is I I do believe at the end of the day that one-on-one is usually the most powerful modality for change, right? And I've been in different types of group programs and there's absolutely a place for that. But I think if if you want to drive kind of the biggest results, there's just nothing that compares to really going with that deeper level, the ongoing relationship with another person. So I really hope that that will be embraced and encouraged in the coaching industry that there's nothing wrong with doing one-on-one. And if you have a business that's quote unquote, just a one-on-one coaching business, that is an incredible business to have. And you can be really happy with that. And you can make the money you want to have, and you can have amazing impact on your clients. Mm. And travel the world with your family. Tell us more about, tell, tell us more about how you were able to do that. Was that something that you've always done or was it all of a sudden, Hey, you know, the company that we've set up is given it afforded us this opportunity. Tell us more about that. Yeah. So I spent uh, six months in 2023 traveling full time with my husband and my two kids who were uh, eight and four at the time. And yeah, we've, we've always traveled a pretty good amount with our kids, but we've known that it's been on the, 
on the list to travel full time for a more extended period sometime and and the stars kind of aligned to to make it happen this year from a business perspective for me since my business is the software business primarily we do have a team that keeps it running day to day we have a team that's answering the customer service emails you know making sure that everyone's taken care of so uh, it is a business where we were able to step back for six months. We were kind of checking in, but we weren't really actively working. But, you know, what's so cool about the software is what people are paying for is the actual software, which really is delivered by a computer, is is not delivered by a human. Um, and it is one of the reasons that I wanted to get into software in the first place was to have a business that I could sell at some point, you know, that I could take time off from. So to go back to the one-on-one -on -one topic, again, I'm not, if, if your dream is, if you're like, I only want to do courses, I don't want to do one-on-one, -on -one, like, great. I think everyone should go for their dream. I just don't want anyone to feel like their dream is not right or is not good enough if if what is truly in their heart is is doing one-on-one. -on -one. And I'm so grateful that people do one-on-one -on -one coaching because I receive so much benefit from it. Mm, mm, fantastic. So you have to share the, the easy free tech hacks. Now, share as many as you can because coaches out there, including <laughs> myself, we need to get rid of a ton of admin uh, in our coaching yes. business. So tell yes. us more. Yeah. So the, the easiest ones to tackle are payment and scheduling. And really at the end of the day, it's about having a clear process for how you do both these things and not deviating from it. So many coaches get on coaching sessions that have not been paid for those coaching sessions, right? That are like, they sent the invoice, the person hasn't quite paid yet, but they already had this call scheduled for third. Oh, it's awkward if I don't show up for the call, but they haven't paid. So one thing is just to have very clear, hard and fast rules. I think coaches should not be paid after they deliver the service. I think coaches should always be paid up front. You know, sometimes you do some sort of discovery call with someone that's free. That's not what I'm talking about. If someone has decided to work with you, you need to be paid before the session. Don't question that. Just listen <laughs> to my advice. Good advice. So yeah, one of it is just getting really clear with you and your clients so that everybody knows, yeah, that invoices need to be paid on time. And this is what on time means. And if they're not, just the, the calls cancel. That's that's just how it is. And along those lines, another, as far as like easy tech hack, accept credit cards. It kills me when I see small businesses who don't want to pay the credit card fees. So they're doing like bank transfers or, you know, in America, they're doing like Venmo, Zelly, things like that. It is well worth the fee because your clients can pay quickly. They can pay easily. And this is exactly what we make easy at Paperbell, because if you're not using Paperbell, I found it's a little tricky to set up payment plans, which is a really common thing for coaches, right? You might have someone on a six month package, they pay every month, whatever fee you need to pay to get that payment plan auto pulled from their credit card is so absolutely worth it. So you're not issuing an invoice and waiting for payment every month. Um, as far as the calendar side, you know, it's something you can use Paperbell for. It's something you can use tools like Calendly and Acuity. Uh, but it's really just sticking to them. A lot of coaches I find feel a little uncomfortable. They're like, oh, well, I'd rather just like email back and forth 40 times than, <laughs> than use the scheduling tool or like, oh, then I have to like, you know, keep my calendar updated. It's like, yeah, put your kid's dentist appointment on the calendar. So it'll automatically talk to your like scheduling tool. Yes, take one second to do that but it's going to make your life so much easier. I have to admit I'm I'm in that process where Calendly has been amazing to mm. have people just give the link we don't have to go back and forward on email yeah. to, to book an appointment and then also there's a part of me that feels like I look forward to the day where I don't give out my calendar link <laughs> as frequently <laughs> as what I do so that I can put in place some boundaries. And I know that you mm. can obviously block out certain mm -hmm. days and so forth, but do you believe in work-life balance? I I do. I do. I think, I think it's what you choose, you know? So yeah, that's a great example with Calendly is it can, it can feel a little scary to say, no, I'm not going to take calls on Tuesday, you know, because you will have that person, right? This is where it gets tricky. You will have that person that says, oh, actually, can you do Tuesday next week because I have this and I have that? 
And sticking to that boundary can feel scary, especially when you're new in your business. But I find it's so funny because we get so nervous about it for ourselves. But we ne- when other people do it, we're never bothered about it. When someone else is like, oh, no, I don't work Tuesday. I, I you know, spend that time with my partner. I spend that time with my kids every Tuesday. We're like, wow, this is so cool. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. But when we yeah. do it ourselves, we can get really nervous about it. And yeah, that's, I think, a good point that these tech tools only work as far as you do, right? So it's like, yeah, if you have a free for all Calendly link where people can book you 24 seven, that make that might make your life more difficult. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yep, totally. So in one to a maximum of three words, what do you think makes a great entrepreneur? I think curiosity is, is a big factor for a great entrepreneur, because I think what's fun about owning your own business is that there's always a new problem to solve, which mm. can also, of course, be very disheartening and overwhelming. Yeah. And you're like, I thought I had this figured out. Now I have to put a schedule on my calendar. I thought just signing up was all I had to do. Now she's telling me I have to like block up time. Uh-huh. So yeah, I think having that curiosity where you're approaching it with a positive attitude where you're like, oh, quarterly taxes. Didn't know about those. Time to learn, <laughs> time to learn something new. You know, it just, it makes it more of a fun adventure if you have that genuine curiosity about learning new things. Mm, mm, Love that. So I'm curious, moving on the back of problem solving, social media and coaches, obviously meet Edgar and one of your your previous um, businesses. What tip have you got out there around just some social media hacks for coaches? Mm -hmm. Like, Mm -hmm. do they need to be consistent? Do they need to be posting on every platform? Give me a a young person's entrepreneurial perspective. (laughs) So I think the thing about social media is I, I am definitely a believer in niching down as far as social media goes. I know this is also a big discussion in the coaching community. It's like, do you, do you have to have a niche? I think the great thing about having a niche is it just makes it really clear for people that you're the right choice for them. Having a niche helps you focus your time on social media because I think the wrong move on social media is just to try to just put out a lot of random content. You know, it's like, okay, I'll record videos every day that are sort of about coaching. But when it's that broad, it's really hard for you to know if you're connecting with the right people. And it's also really hard for the right people to find you. I think the more specific you can get with what problem you solve, or what you know, topic that you coach around, what, what person you help, then you can create really targeted content that is much more likely to reach the right person. Um, and I think the important thing to remember is that to you, it often feels very boring and very redundant. You know, this is something I always, when I was in the social media world in my last business, I always reminded people, you see 100% of your social content but you're the only one who does, right? So like if you're writing on Twitter every day, if you're like recording videos every day, you've read every tweet, you've seen every video and you're like, Jesus Christ, I've already recorded 42 videos (laughs) about this like gentle parenting technique or whatever. But, you know, only 3% of the people who followed you saw any of those videos. And especially in how we consume content now and it, you know, it being so fast and it being so quick shot, like you don't, you don't have much time to say much and every, if you're doing like short, short form videos. So yes, I would think about social, about what messages do you want to share? Who do you want to talk to? How can you just hammer home those messages? And then it'll also help you spend time. It's like on Facebook. Okay. Now you can join Facebook groups that are only for that kind Mm. of little community that's interested in that. And then you have like a much, much better chance of finding potential clients there. Mm. Do you, with your own social media, do you go across the, all the platforms? Do you hit all of them or through schedule, like a, like a tool, like meet Edgar? Yeah. So we do use meet Edgar. Um, We're on Instagram, um, Facebook, I mean, we're on Twitter, but nobody sees it. I don't find coaches are very active on Twitter. Um, but, you know, honestly, I wouldn't look at our social media as any sort of a guide because we're not, it's like we publish a lot of blog content and that's mm-hmm. our main thing. So we have 
you know, kind of little teasers for the blog content on social, but it's not a main driver of business for us. Yep. All right. So let's finish with, uh, what about your top three tips for young budding coaches out there? Yeah. I mean, my top tips for coaches is first of all, take, take your business seriously, right? Like we were talking about earlier, a company of one, and we're talking about scheduling tools and payment tools. Um, I mean, what's so cool about the internet is all this stuff is so easy to set up, right? Whether you're using Paperbell or you're using another tool. I mean, I've run online businesses a long time. You used to have to get your own like credit card merchant account and everything was really complicated. And you had to like (laughs) figure out these really complicated tools, you know, something like taking credit cards online. Anyone can do that with Stripe, you know, PayPal, you can sign up for PayPal and we connect you with one of those accounts. Go ahead and do that right from day one, you know, and it often doesn't cost you anything too. It often is just that transaction fee that you're paying when someone actually pays you. So yeah, professionalize your business from the beginning because it's not that complicated to do so. And by that, I don't mean spend $10,000 on some sort of, you know, fancy logo and photo shoot. I just mean your bu- the business side of your business, make it easy yep. and make it professional for your yep. clients. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, another tip for coaches starting out would, would be to niche down is, is my point of view on the topic, especially when you're starting, it's just going to make your life so much easier. And if you don't know what niche to serve, just do what you actually want <laughs> would be my advice. If you're like, wow, Passion, it'd be where great. You, where your heart is. Yeah. 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 You know, and I, mm. it's funny. I find that people often, I find a, a coaching question that's very effective is, well, what do you secretly want in this scenario? Like for some reason, a lot of people think whatever their real desire is, is like the wrong one. I mean, a funny thing people do is they're like, oh, but everybody wants that one. I remember when I was traveling, I started watching these videos about Korea because we went to Korea and there was this video where she's like, oh, you know, it was always my lifelong dream. She's American. It was always my lifelong dream to move to Korea. But, you know, everybody wants to move to Korea. (laughs) No, not everybody wants to move to Korea to her it seemed that way you know mm. she's like oh what a silly dream who doesn't want to move to Korea <laughs> that's so, hilarious yeah I find that's a good way to find out is like okay if you could secretly just work with this one type of client like who who would that be you know that's that's often the, mm-hmm. the real answer mm. um and yeah I mean lastly it would be just just to keep going I think is so much of, of running a business. I was actually just listening to a business podcast right before this. And they were talking about the story of someone running like a TV newspaper radio network and their company was focused on, on mergers and acquisitions and they ended up buying ABC. And that was kind of the deal that made the company. And it was, it was 30 years in to the guy's tenure as CEO, you know, before he landed that, that big deal that really made the company successful. And it's like, he was just, he was just in it for a long time. And I'm, you know, I'm not saying it's going to take 30 years before you have any kind mm-hmm. of success with your coaching business. Obviously they had other successes before then, but myself, someone who has been an entrepreneur for a long time, I have seen this, that just sticking with it, like even when it's boring, even when you're a bit sick of it, even when you're kind of not sure what you're doing, like just kind of showing up and and doing it and kind of working your way it's kind of like a relationship right like sometimes you just need to leave and sometimes you're like I gotta I gotta hang around and and figure this out you know and I think with a business you might end up pivoting you might end up doing different businesses but the more you can just stay in the game and keep trying to figure it out like you will figure it out you will Mm. get there Mm, build those resiliency muscles yeah. because you need them. You need them. That's for sure. <laughs> Laura Roder from paperbell.com. Thank you so much for your time and your energy. I appreciate you and thanks everyone for listening. Thank you.